Okay, and we okay, are. Okay, so I guess with that, I'd, I'd like to um, thank everybody for being here and call to order the um, uh, Solar Bylaw Working Group meeting of um, uh, July 29th, 2022. Um, and thank everybody for being here. I do see we have some uh, folks from the public as well. So thank you for your attendance. Uh, we will uh, have an opportunity for public comment at the end of the agenda. Um, and um, I think we, we certainly have a quorum and I think uh, we have everybody, which is fantastic, um, I believe. Um, and thank you, Stephanie, uh, uh, as staff to be being here and, and maybe Chris will join us. I'm not sure if she's gonna- She's running a little bit late. She's okay, trying yep. to no, wrap she... something up. She'll be joining shortly. Okay, so just as a quick uh, rundown on the agenda, uh, we want to um, review the minutes from last uh, meeting. Um, just as a suggestion, it's really helpful if people read the minutes ahead of time and have comments prepared uh, uh, so that we can get through that process relatively quickly. But um, here's uh, the minutes from last meeting. Um, we'll review those. Um, uh, before we jump into that, just to update everybody on the agenda and the, the public, uh, we'll have some uh, uh, staff updates, uh, if any, from Stephanie and from uh, Chris. Um, uh, Jack, um, are you prepared? You can help us lead us through a, a discussion uh, and overview of the uh, PVP, uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission uh, model, bylaw, and guideline. That would yes. be fantastic. Thank you for that. And um, and Laura, were you? Um, I hope you're doing well. And and are you um, able to? provide us with yeah. a uh, sort yeah. of a, a, an update on, on some of the recent land court decisions that you flagged for us. Yeah. Super. Okay. And then, uh, and then we'll have a, um, a presentation and, and discussion as, 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 as helpful uh, with regard to the solar mapping tool, uh, GIS tool uh, that the town of Amherst has a bit of a correction there or an update um, for this week or this meeting. That will not be an overview of the whole land use uh, uh, um, situation in, in, in Amherst by Chris. It'll be more a introduction to the GIS tool um, and, um, and how that tool can be helpful to us. Uh, and that will be led by uh, Michael Warner uh, from the IT department in Amherst. Um, and, then, and then we'll tee up for our next meeting, uh, an overview uh, of the land use um, uh, maps uh, uh, that Chris can present to us um, at the, our next meeting. Um, I want to go over um, a work plan and time ske a schedule uh, for where we are today and where we and what happens between in my in my mind to sort of set out some uh, key uh, tasks in front of us uh, and a time frame to accomplish what we need to accomplish by May of next year. Uh, so I have had that sort of laid out for uh, to bring forward for um, input from everybody and discussion. Um, we'll get an update on the solar assessment um, RFQ that <clears throat> um, the town has prepared or has gone out uh, or will be going out shortly uh, from Stephanie and, and, and I can uh, provide some input on that as well. Uh, and then we need a little bit of time to discuss the next meeting. Um, because there's some conflicts um, for next uh, two Fridays from now. Uh, and then we'll uh, have, have an opportunity for public comment. Okay, so with that, um, any uh, questions or anything on the agenda before we get going? Super, okay, so let's um, uh, address um, agenda topic number one, which is review and a vote on the minutes. Uh, so, have people had time to look at the, the minutes and are there any comments or, or um, anything that anybody wants to offer with regard to the minutes from last meeting? Um, and um, uh, that this would be the time to do that. Thank you. Yeah, Martha. Hi. Just a short comment. It might be interesting to include in the minutes how many uh, members of the public are listening in. I know 
uh, the minutes mentioned the three people who spoke, but just giving a number of how many people were tuned in might be interesting to have for future reference. Yeah, I mean, it does, it, it, it probably goes up and down during the course of the meeting, but um, is there any issues with that, uh, Stephanie? I don't think so. It just will be challenging to capture. I mean, I can give a rough idea, but as yeah. Dwayne noted, it changes throughout the meeting. So I, I can't definitively say how many people stay through the whole meeting. Yeah. Okay, and just I, I see uh, Chris is in the, uh, in the, I'm not sure if you want to move her into the panelist side. But, yes. Yeah. Sorry, I just have to open up. Great. Okay, and then uh, just for people who weren't there, I, last meeting was interesting and actually very nice because uh, it was uh, in person, but hybrid. Uh, and so that created some additional challenges, but also opportunities. Uh, we will remain remote for these meetings through at least March. Um, and we can discuss that um, towards the end of the, the meeting. That's the, that's the plan So at this point. Um, okay, so um, if there's no other comments, uh, on the uh, minutes from last meeting, do I do we have a motion to accept the minutes as they have been prepared? Yep, Robert. Yep, I think you need to actually voice your uh, motion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I move we accept the minutes. I'll second. Great. So we got Janet as a second. Okay, and I'll have to call a, a voice vote. So please make sure you unmute your microphone as I call your name. McGowan? Yes, yes. Pagliarulo? Yes. Jemsek? Uh, yeah, I, I watched the video, so I, I think I can approve the minutes, so. You can. Yeah. Thank you. Hanner? Yes. Corcoran? Yes. Brooks? Yes. Breger? Yes. Okay, minutes are approved. Thank you. All right, thank you, everybody. And um, who, 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 who took the minutes? I just want to thank it was. A, I did. Robert, yeah, thank you um, for taking those minutes last time. I know it was um, an abrupt uh, to find out that you were selected as your first name, your, your alphabetical order. But um, thank you for doing that. My pleasure. OK. Um, all right, so moving on to um, agenda topic two, which is staff updates. Um, let me open it up to uh, uh, Stephanie first. Sure, thank you, Duane. Um, so very quickly, um, and this may cover a bit of item number seven as well. Um, the solar assessment did go out, the RFP went out on Monday. Um, Duane was very instrumental in the development of that, um, of the draft and the final version. Um, so um, I think it included you know, interests of this group as well. And I know he'll be covering some of that information later and may have more to say in item seven. Um, and other than that, I don't really have any other updates at this point. Great. All right, thank you, Stephanie. Um, yep, yeah, Janet. Could could we see a copy of that, to what, of what went out so we know so, what you're looking at? So I did actually send it, um, I did send it uh, to you all, it's in your packet. And it's in the meeting packet online as well. And and um, I think Stephanie, you sent that just like um, I sent it just before ago. the meeting, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. so it's in your packet, and it um, on the in in the online packet, it's posted. Great. All right, Chris. Any um, updates that you want to bring forward um, from the planning side? Um, we are working on a scope of services for a consultant to help us with the zoning bylaw. Um, Nate has been talking to the uh, building commissioner, Rob Mora, as well as to Stephanie Ciccarello, and he's gotten um, feedback from them. So we're hoping to have a um, scope of services that's uh, finalized um, probably the second week in uh, August, and then put that out to bid shortly thereafter. Great, and and uh, that will um, is um, accounted for or at least uh, mentioned in my uh, work plan and timeline. Uh, so when we get in item uh, six, I guess. Um, so when we get to that, 
uh, maybe that's a good time to um, speak a little bit about where in the juncture of, of our uh, 10 months to go or something uh, that the uh, technical uh, consultant will be most helpful to us and um, um, and, and um, uh, how that sort of fits into our work plan. Um, but that's good to hear, Chris. Thank you. And um, Jen, is your hand up again or was it just remained up? It's actually up again. Maybe it'll be covered later, but um, is that is the scope of services for like drafting the whole bylaw or just the battery section? Because I thought I've sort of heard two different things in different meetings. So I haven't, I have, may I answer that? Yeah. I haven't seen the final um, scope of services that Rob Mora and Nate and Stephanie put together. Um, so I can report on that next time. And once we have the scope of services together, um, we can show it to you. I believe it does include more than just the technical things as far as um, batteries and things like that. I think it might actually include drafting, but Stephanie probably saw a later draft than I did and she may be able to answer that question. Could we see that and have some input on it since we're ultimately the ones who are gonna be sending the bylaw? And it's- so That's yeah. not common. Um, the um, RFPs and things like that are sent out through the town manager's office. Um, we can show you, show it to you once it's finished, but it's not common to have um, the board give input on that. And maybe Stephanie can talk about that a little bit. Um, if I may, Dwayne. Yes, so please. we are, um, Dwayne is reviewing these documents on behalf of the, of the committee, um, but we don't typically share it with an entire committee. Um, and the reason why Duane is being consulted is because um, this is his area of expertise. So we're referring to him as the expert on developing um, this particular uh, document. So he'll be weighing in on behalf of the committee. And, so, and to that extent, uh, um, when we get to the work plan and timeline, um, I'd be open to hearing um, comments and thoughts from the working group on, on um, um, your your thoughts um, and our collective thoughts in terms of um, where we could use the most technical assistance um, as we move forward. So so the planning board, there's an RFP going out for um, design review guidelines that we've seen. And so I think it's sort of odd that the scope of services that's supposed to be advising our board and the bylaw that we wouldn't be looking at it and getting input on that. I just find that unusual. And is there anything wrong with us seeing it and giving input? Like what's yeah. the downside? Well, I, I, can I speak? Sorry, I didn't raise my hand. <laughs> um, uh, I am, you know, I would imagine that um, having multiple people comment on this RFP, which I kind of look at as distinct from the bylaw to a certain extent, um, would be cumbersome for the staff of the of the town. So I can see why having Dwayne, I think it's great, Dwayne, that you're able to review it. And I and I trust that you'll, you know, be looking at it for, you know, through the lens of the of the working group. But um, I look at the RFP as quite distinct from the work here, just having been involved in a lot of GIS work for siting of wind and solar. Um, so I'm I'm comfortable with it, but Aren't we talking about the RFP for legal consultant for the bylaw? Is that where we're, is that the? Um, sorry, go ahead, Chris. I'm... This is not a legal consultant. This is a consultant who knows about um, solar bylaws and the technicalities of solar installation. And um, we're seeking someone who can advise us as we write our solar bylaw and I'm that person may or may not get into the actual drafting of the bylaw but it's um, an advisory to um, us who are going to be putting together the bylaw and as we move forward there may be issues that we have concerns about or questions about and this person will be able to do research and um, support us um, and in fact it is unusual, let, let me just say this, um, for the public to get involved in the development of RFPs. It's it's quite unusual. Um, usually those are uh, reserved for um, 
the accounting department who sends them out. And then as someone uh, requests the RFP, um, then that person is sent the RFP and, and then the accounting department keeps track of it all. So it's, it's not usual for the public or boards and committees to get involved in drafting these things. Um, so I just wanted to um, say that, thank you. Right, um, okay, um, Martha? I think you have a finger up at least. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Just a, just a comment on that. Then maybe it would be appropriate, and maybe Dwayne, you said later when we talk about the work plan. But it would seem that we ought to at least have a few minutes where people could, uh, in our committee, could make suggestions of technical aspects we could uh, think of that might we might later want uh, information about. Or let me put it this way: Does the uh, does the RFP define specifically what areas of expertise or, or what topics could be included, or is it broad enough that that new topics could be added as we went along? A good question. Yes, Stephanie. Typically, when we draft these types of documents, Martha, we try to leave some um, room for. Uh, fine tuning them with the consultant. So typically it will say, it will list some things, but it will say, uh, will include, but not limited to. Mm -hmm. So that language gives us uh, an opportunity to expand if we want to. Um, it's hard because until you actually get the proposal by the consultant, you're not exactly sure how that will look until you actually have the conversation with the consultant and you work it out more. So there's more refinement that can come. And once the consultant is brought on board, um, they'll, you know, there'll be an opportunity for, um, for some input, I would think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's, it would seem that it would be appropriate for us to uh, give input in that sense, not, you know, having to read the RFP, but correct, but just be able to uh, say, gee, we think this particular topic would be important to expertise. Yeah, and that's what, I, I, to some extent, I don't think we will know all, all the things we don't know and want to know from right. the yeah. consultant until we get into it. Uh, but at this point, I, I wouldn't mind spending some time in, in topic, uh, in, in agenda item six, um, to at least um, bring forward uh, some of our ideas currently with regard to where we think we will need some technical support. Um, and that can help me uh, in, in uh, assuring that the um, scope of work is is uh, appropriately um as appropriate um uh, appropriately specific or broad <laughs> uh, to make sure that we can cover those things all right thank you chris um any any other updates from chris or, or stephanie before we move on awesome thanks um okay great so let's move on to Agenda item three, um, which is um, for Jack to lead us uh, lead us here in a, in a, in a uh, review or discussion of, of the uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission um, model bylaw and 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 it's more than just a model bylaw; it's a sort of a whole guideline on how to go about doing uh, model bylaws or about bylaws. Um, and um, you know, I think it's a it's a um, Jack, I don't think you were here last time, but um, Martha provided a good overview similarly to for, to the uh, Cape Cod Commission model bylaw and the um, and DOER's uh, model bylaw, uh, a bit dated, but but useful as a reference as well. Uh, PVPC, obviously, uh, being our local planning authority, is uh, as an important resource for us. Uh, and so uh, in my review of that, it looked really, really helpful and thorough. Uh, and uh, and I know you, and maybe you can start off just by um, providing your relationship with PVPC, which I know is uh, you you, uh, you have a um, uh, um, connection with them through through the town of Amherst and just make that clear as well. All right, so thanks, yeah. Jeff. Yeah. Thank you, Dwayne. And uh, again, I, I watched the video of the meeting from last okay. week and, and uh and uh you know heard martha's uh summary of the doer and, and the cape cod commission i know uh the piner valley planning commission you know references the the doer because i think that set the stage um but anyway i'm uh, i just retired off the planning board after six years uh I'm, i was the commissioner to the pioneer valley planning commissioner i'm 
now an alternate commissioner on the executive committee there on the Pioneer Valley uh, Planning Commission, but uh, I in no way, you know, am an expert <laughs> on, on this document, but they have, uh, they put a lot of effort into it, I know. Um, I forget the date of it, but you know, it was a few years ago, but it, it was, it, it, it seems to be a, a very good document for us to lean on. Um, and, you know, with that said, I mean, um, I don't know how to summarize it, but I, I'm just gonna look at the table of contents and then I highlighted some sections uh, of the guide that I thought was interesting that I think I'll, I'll just mention. But, you know, with regard to how it's set up, you know, we have the, um, you know, some, some, you know, overview sections, um, you know, the definitions, applicability, that thing, that sort of thing, you know, standards for small scale solar arrays, the site plan approval process that again, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission really uh, caters to towns that don't have the uh, luxury of the town of Amherst, where we have staff like Chris and Stephanie that that can do a lot of work. So, you know, th this is you know they, when they do work, they are geared to helping, you know, say mun municipalities in the hill towns and things like that that just they can't afford to uh, to do, you know, what they need to do from a from a planning perspective. Uh, but to go on. Um, you know, they, they mentioned environmental standards, uh, the construction maintenance monitoring uh, uh, and modifications associated with these types of developments, uh, the discontinuance and removal, the financial certainty, uh, uh, payment in lieu of taxes, um, and then the permitting process. So they, they, they very thorough, very thorough. Um, and they even speak to the battery storage. And again, I represent the, the Water Supply uh, Protection Committee, and we are doing a white paper on uh, you know, water resources impacts uh, from uh, potential solar arrays, and we're looking at the battery uh, uh, storage impacts as well. So that'll be forthcoming, hopefully, in a, in a few weeks. Um, so with that, I just, I'm just going to go through what, what I, I, you know, this document is what's 183 pages, but I, I kind of just went through it and I, I'm just going to read certain sections I think that are salient and pertinent to what we might uh, want to be uh, considering uh, during this bylaw development. So uh, first one is, is on uh, page 10 of this document and DOER's view, given the plain language of the statute, it is prudent to allow opportunity to cite all scales of solar energy systems somewhere in the community. But that was uh, 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 interesting. And then, you know, not all towns are alike. Some are more forested, others, you know, more, you know, agricultural. And you kind of, you know, it's not one size fits all. So every community is going to be a little bit different. But this also on the page 10 there. Further, it is possible that reasonable regulation could be context dependent. For example, barring forest clearing for more than two acres of land may eliminate the potential for most solar development on 90% of potential sites in a town that is heavily forested. While not doing so in another municipality with more unforested land is another matter. So constriction imposed by specific site siting requirements are worth considering carefully in development of a municipal solar zoning bylaw or ordinance. Um, and then green community sat status. One of the five criteria to earn designation as a green community is passage of a zoning bylaw re related to a renewable energy, which provides for as of right siting uh, of at least one type of renewable energy manufacturing or generation facility in at least one zoning district or designated location as follows. To qualify as a green community, a, a municipality or other local government body shall provide for as of right siting of renewable or alternative energy generating facilities, renewable or alternative energy research and development facilities, or renewable or alternative energy manufacturing facilities in designated locations. Um, and again, there's you know as of right special permit. 
uh, and there's, you know, this is on page 17. Um, they are discussing components of a bylaw ordinance, typically in the applicability section and some sample language. So certainly there, there are things that you know, should be fairly easy to implement and, and approve. Um, but they do have a section called not permitted. And um, there are three items they say set there. And again, this is this has no relevant relevance. This is an example they're putting out there, but any solar uh, voltaic installation of greater than 20 acres of previously undeveloped land in a fenced area could be not permitted. You know, it's just an example. Any solar uh, voltaic installation requiring forest claim greater than 10 acres, uh, any solar voltaic installation on slopes of 15% or greater as averaged over 50 horizontal feet, uh, you know, is another item. So, and, and they do have a sample bylaw ordinance language. Uh, the municipalities may want to identify specific standards or criteria for the site plan approval of solar voltaic installations and its related applica uh, application requirements. And then they, this is on uh, page 24. And again, just, just excellent you know, guidelines. A lot of work was put in uh, to this. Um, for me, you know, I, I, just a, you know, and I talked with Chris Brestrip about this, is the, the, the most important part of this, um, I think, is the construction monitoring. Because that's where we see all uh, the mistakes happen and all the, you know, horrible kind of natural resources consequence, uh, consequences. So uh, they, they have a detailed, you know, section here on construction monitoring. The construction monitoring costs may be required to be covered by the developer as one of the conditions in the approved agreement. Alternatively, approval may be conditioned upon having an engineer provide weekly reports to the supervising authority indicating the work completed and stamping it as being substantial compliance with the approved plans. And I think the examples that we've seen out there that have been failures, I'm thinking Williamsburg, that, you know, I, that was all a monitoring uh, snafu, in, in my opinion, anyway. So, um, and it just, you know, it just goes on, but I think that's, that's a, 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 should be, you know, very important part of what we're doing is to uh, ensure that what is approved is properly uh, installed with regard to stormwater pre uh, prevention uh, plan that would be implemented with it and that it's monitored and it's documented. Oh, uh, what else we got here? And then they talk about financial surety. That, that's not my deal, but it's it's certainly the the um, uh, the boilerplate sort of language is there. Uh, and again, I, they they the they reference the town of Shutesbury bylaw um, as an example. I guess it was one of the earlier ones uh, to go through. But again, that. Every town's different, and um, basically, that's that's my my. I don't know how many minutes I was, but <laughs> my, my my abridged uh, version of, of of that guideline. Great, thank you, uh, thank you, Jack. Um, that was really helpful. Um, any any uh, thoughts or questions on for Jack? on the PVPC guide? My impression is that the three different guides that we have are fairly consistent overall. You know, they have, one may have more detail than another on a particular uh, section. Do, do others agree that they're fairly consistent, uh, that there's no real outstanding differences in what they emphasize or? I, I liked, this one maybe best of all because it kind of talked about like more about in more detail about choices you can make um mm -hmm. and it reminded me the good parts of the athol saying you know like you could do this you could do that what does your community want and you can tailor it so i felt like you know in terms of 
a good roadmap for a bylaw, this would be a great model to follow and help us guide, you know, what sections we want or what problems we want to, you know, deal with or whatever, or where to, you know, just, I just thought it was like the more detailed, more current, the best of the three. Yeah. Yeah. I also like the Cape Cod plan in some of the environmental statements. I thought those, those were good. We might not agree with every specific in them, but but the things that they called out, I thought were worthwhile to as a recipe too. Um, I keep on thinking about like putting together like a, a, a skeleton bylaw, maybe putting in like too many bones, too many provisions, like just a giant thing and then thinning it out or emphasizing things over another. So I think these would be good. All of these would be good to see how many bones we can put on that skeleton and then start to kind of work through it through the community process and our own process. And then, you know, the, the consultants. Yeah. Great, that, um, yeah, I would just add to that. Um, that was sort of um, my thought as well that we can review when I we look at the work plan uh, with the idea that, you know, I, I similar to Martha, I guess I was um, comforted in some ways by looking at these three model bylaws. Um, and there's definitely recognition that they all have similarity in in structure and 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 the the uh uh different topics or issues uh that were addressed in in the bylaw so there's some really good models out there um what i think um i'd like to think about in these different models and i, I would agree pvpc gives some really good guidance as well as just language mm -hmm. um is um is uh trying to within with with the skeleton as you referenced it uh janet of what the structure might look like where what are the what are the key issues that we really need to deliberate on uh there's probably a lot in there that we don't need a whole lot of deliberation on because there's pretty good models for those and they're not overly controversial uh but then there's some some bigger issues that we uh, do want to deliberate on uh, as a body uh to provide some recommendations um and then also um where the where we need some technical support um, to uh, to um, reach uh, informed decisions or recommendations, um, and um, and that's where, in my mind, the consultant would be helpful to us, as well as uh, some expertise we have on this working group itself. Okay, great. Any other? Uh, and thank you for that, Jack. And and any um, other um, um, thoughts or comments? Uh, on 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 the model bylaws generally before we go on. Great. Okay. Um, so let's go back to uh, the agenda and um, then look at at um, uh, agenda item number four, uh, which is um, uh, an update and discussion on on these recent uh, land court rulings and then some other uh, things that have recently come come our way, but. Um, anything that, um, uh, Laura, you might be able to provide a bit of a summary and some background. I know you have a lot of uh, um, perspective and, and work in this area, so that would all be really yeah. helpful. So just to give everyone, um, so I work more on the real estate side of things now when it comes to solar, but historically, you know, I've been in the industry for 17 years, um, wearing a number of hats from finance to development. Um, and this recently came to light for me because I know there was a lot of um, developers in Massachusetts, um, some notable ones like Nexamp, um, who were engaged in lengthy um, legal proceedings in certain towns where they had been trying to develop a solar project. Um, so I found this, and it seems pretty, and I, and I went back and I looked at a number, you know, a lot of these communities have, um, recorded hearings on Zoom, which was really helpful. Uh, and, I, and I listened to a lot of those, but essentially um, there's a section, and this is unique to Massachusetts because um, it's not, it's certainly not the case in New York. Um, you know, typically in this state, or, you know, you have um, home rule, which is essentially communities can create their own rules for, um, you know, development of certain things, but this Massachusetts general law uh, 40A section three essentially says no zoning ordinance or bylaw 
shall prohibit or unreasonably regulate the installation of solar energy systems or the building of structures that facilitate the collection of solar energy, except where necessary to protect public health, safety, or welfare. And those three pieces, the, the word necessary has come up and then protect public health, safety, or welfare. So not, not private um, health, safety, or welfare. Um, so the two, two uh, rulings I sent to you were from the town of Northbridge and the town of Braintree where special use permits were originally denied. And then the court basically said, you know, overruled that. Um, so it seems as though in Massachusetts, they've designated a certain group of sort of public things where communities are, have been asked to sort of stand down um, when it comes to their typical uh, zoning interests. This includes things like education, agriculture, daycare, um, and solar is now is now a part of that because of the state's commitment to move um, away from fossil fuels. So what I sent around essentially the summary is you can only deny permits if you find that impact on public health, safety, or welfare. Um, so an example that I heard, which I thought was really interesting, is that this distinction between a private interest versus a public interest. Um, you know, if you, which is very interesting to me, um, if you were gonna find that something was going to uh, pollute your well on your property, that is a private interest versus a public interest, which is, you know, polluting an aquifer, which I, you know, that was a distinction that was made by one of the attorneys in this, in this ruling. Um, so, in summary, you know, things like view sheds, aesthetics don't qualify here. You need to find something. Um, if you were going to decline a, a solar facility, it would have to be something that was going against the public welfare, not a private nuisance. So in, in the words that were used were you need to be able to have essentially an intractable public health, safety, or welfare issue. So that's that's essentially what I what I found when I was reading these and listening to the summaries. Um, online. That's it. I wasn't aware of these things, honest to God. Um, and it's it's very unique for Massachusetts to be totally, totally frank. Oftentimes, and, you know, historically, when we have developed solar projects in states like, and I don't do solar development anymore, but in the past, when we developed solar projects in states like New York, um, we had to ad adhere to any bylaw that was uh, put forth. Um, and that was it, you know, it just kind of shut it down. Um, whereas in Massachusetts, what the courts, what the legislation is telling us is, you know, they view solar as a public good for the residents of Massachusetts. And unless there's some sort of, you know, public risk, um, we're not in our right to say that it can't go anywhere. So that was important for our bylaw working group. At the same time, you know, I think, you know, I've been sort of vacillating on, well, does it make sense to have a bylaw then? And I think that, um, you know, oftentimes developers, just the developer perspective is they don't want to make the community angry. Um, you know, this is not in their best interests. So if you have things that you want to see, because even in these court cases that I was looking at, um, the developers, the good developers like Nexamp, have gone above and beyond to meet the community's requirements, even though they're not required to. Things like setbacks and landscaping and you know, things of that nature, um, just because they wanna be a good participant in the community, um, even though they're not required to by law. So that's all I have, Dwayne. I see Martha. Great. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that, Laura. That was, that was really helpful. And by the way, I'm in no way an expert on this. So if you're going to come at me with intense legal questions, <laughs> I don't have the answers. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, yeah, Martha. Yeah, I mean, I'm certainly no expert, much less than you, Laura. But, you know, I read these things and it struck me that, you know, a couple of those cases were really kind of weird, like Waltham, well, he didn't want to put a road through, you no, I mean, that sounds like, yeah, that was kind of extreme or, or you know, they only had 2% of their land where they would allow solar mm -hmm. at all. 
uh, and so I didn't get the impression that things were quite as extreme as, as sort of maybe the picture that that you were painting here in, in terms of the flexibility we'd be allowed. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know the a couple of the one of the other cases. Well, it was because the planning board wanted, you know, higher higher hedges or something uh, in, in in front for the visual appearance, and mm -hmm. that was ru ruled to be inconsequential or or, or something. So uh, it seems that that yes, we have to take this all very seriously in the way we you know word a bylaw, but we shouldn't be spooked by it yeah. because it seems like the there would be a fair amount of flexibility as long as it's quote reasonable and in public health safety and welfare martha i think yes there yeah. are more, there but, are more. but i i mean i you know you're saying if it's polluting one person's well it's not a, a public health issue i would really wonder about that it yeah. seems to me that if somebody's on not on town water sure that has to be on on, on the well Sure. Uh, because there's just no, you know, borderline in that part of the community or something that that would be a, sure. uh, you know, something sure. that should be a public concern. Uh, yeah, but. perhaps that was a poor example. I think that yeah. someone else from the community, and that was an example that the attorney gave when they were uh -huh. putting forth this case yeah. as a distinction between a private nuisance yeah. versus a, a public nuisance. Um, but I think that this. you're going to start seeing more of these rulings because it's in our it's in our laws, um, and I know that I believe someone from the public, um, Jenny Callick, sent something um, that mentions this exact same land code from the Supreme Court of Massachusetts as well. So I just want to I want to surface it for everyone. I want to make sure that we're not all spinning our wheels here, um, creating bylaws that can, you know, be overruled. Um, so, anyways. And, and, and just for clarification, uh, for anybody who can help to clarify, <laughs> Laura or, or or Chris, maybe um, it doesn't it doesn't mean that you can't write a write zoning bylaws for solar, uh, but you can write. But if, if you do have a a, by, a, a, a zoning uh, that allows for solar to go in a certain area, uh, and they seek a permit, then it can't be with it can't be withheld due to. Um, uh, um, due to, due to re reasons, unless there's some argument that it's it's uh, um, hurting public welfare, health, uh, or, or health, uh, and I think it also means that just generally for the town, the zoning has to be reasonable to enable solar development, uh, but it doesn't it, it it doesn't preclude us from from uh, a zoning bylaw that gives guidance and, and directions in terms of where totally. where and how solar can be developed. Yeah, it just can't be overly restrictive, I agree. Okay, um, yeah, please. I think Jack was up and then Janet. Yeah, I just wanted to like push the brakes a little bit on terms of uh, water supply impacts of solar development. I mean, I think, you know, we're, we're working on this white paper and we are just coming up with, you know, zero sort of impact uh, with yes. regard to Sorry. the yeah. type of uh, the leachability of solar panels, the whole operation. Again, the construction monitoring is very important and with regard to the erosion and sedimentation, that sort of thing. But these solar panels and that, they're fairly inert. And so I, I, I just wanna push yeah. the brakes on, on when sure. we talk about water resources impact. Yeah. Uh, for solar development. That was a really poor example. I, I was trying to make the distinction between public and private, but I completely agree with you. So, for okay. example, struck from the record, please. <laughs> okay. And then uh, Janet, and the, I think Robert might have had his hand up, but um, no. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Janet, please. So, so I have to say, I enjoyed reading um, these cases more than I expected. Um, so, <laughs> because yeah. it's, it's what I used to do all the time, um, work on appeals and things like that. And so I think the most important case is Tracer Lane because it's the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts and they're interpreting um, chapter 40A, section three as it relates to solar regulation by towns. And so the land court cases were kind of all over the place. They're not, they're not precedential. doesn't mean like, so, that, so if a land court case someone makes a ruling 
no, the next land court or judge doesn't have to follow it. So, but we all have to follow the SJC. And so what I took from that, you know, I, I thought that the, the cases I looked at were sort of like extreme facts. And so in Tracer Lane, Waltham has one to 2% of its land zoned for large scale so solar and the rest of it is not, right? They could have, you know, rooftop and things like that. And what was going on there was, there was gonna be an access road in a residential neighborhood going to a solar facility in Lexington. And you know, you could just see this, the Supreme Judicial Court could not get over how minimal that was. And so, you know, and I, you know, you could see the same thing in some of the other cases where, you know, the hedges, like these people had done every, the facility had done everything they can to do the hedges and, you know, you know, the, the, the land court was like, come on, they it's negligent impact and just went off. And so, but the SJC doesn't go off on an extreme thing. It basically says you need reasons for your regulation. And they really the reasons have to have a rational relationship, a reasonable relationship to public health, safety, and welfare. And those are really broad categories. And what I thought was sort of unfair is asking the planning board to come up with those reasons when actually it's town meeting or the town council who's supposed to have those reasons when it's drafting. But pushing that aside, you know, so I just thought that Tracer Lane is the one that lays out the standard, you know, if you wanted to protect some area of town, it's reasonable, it's reasonable to say, to protect neighborhood character, residential neighborhood character. So you could say, no 20 acre facilities in, you know, residential zone um, or, you know, limits like that. But you have to explain how you get there and why. And um, so I, I think that it's an important case that when this bylaw comes out, it's a, the reasons for the choices that are made by the town council are laid out. So nobody has to guess. And in case after case, I read three cases, the planning board couldn't come up with any reason that you know they're not giving a reason and you know in terms of the aesthetics actually the supreme court has said zoning can be based on based on aesthetics that could be part of public welfare and i read a case that i can't remember the name of it um the north bridge says the opposite of the case it's citing and so i wouldn't i mean the land court is important but the sjc i think has set out a framework saying you better have some really good reasons that relate to public health safety and welfare um, you know, welfare could be, you know, environmental reasons, you know, we all, you know, if you, if you had a foresty a limitation on forests, you know, forests do a lot of good for the public. And so just justify it and explain it and support it. Um, but also all that said, that's, that's my interpretation, but Chris, I think it'd be really, I did look up some, um, consultants that have, were, you know, summarizing tracer, tracer lane, but I wonder if there's like town, town attorney could give us some guidance, like, where can we go? Where can't we go? Or what we need to do to justify, you know, our recommendations to town council? May I say something? So yeah, please, Chris. Normally, when we're developing a, a bylaw, we do um, consult with town council, and we send them drafts to make sure that we're on the right um, path, and. You know, hopefully we will send them early drafts and not just, you know, rush them at the end before that something goes to our town council CIL. But um, yes, we do. We do involve our town attorney in developing um, bylaws, particularly ones that are, are um, that seem to be like they might have some controversy associated with them. Yeah, I mean, this decision came out like a month ago, so it's probably a hot topic that people are discussing and, and <clears throat> reviewing and, you know, town towns and cities everywhere are, are going to be saying, what can we regulate, what can't we? Um, I think it would be safe to say that we should should not limit one or two percent of our land to large solar. You know, it was like these were the two, three cases I went were sort of on the extremes, sure. you know, so like, let's not be on the extremes. <laughs> Agreed. Um, one, one comment. Um... What would be helpful, I don't know if this is possible for the working group, but um, Christine, Stephanie, and, and Dwayne, if it's possible to have, so have the attorney for the town just look at these rulings and tell us where we should focus. I mean, what I, what I don't wanna have happen is 
we spend all this thought and energy developing these wonderful bylaws. Um, and then we mm -hmm. find out that, you know, aesthetics doesn't stand or, you know, I mean, obviously environmental health, like through the work on the conservation committee, obviously you have to be very cautious with all that wetlands and so forth. But, um, but I would, I would love to see, you know, so that the attorney who took some of these cases to court was actually based in Northampton. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, I don't know if that's possible, if that's a, a good use of a uh, town resource, but, um, you know, it would just be good to know sort of what our guardrails are, um, you know, versus you know, where we can play and where we can't. Great, thank you. Yep, Jack. I just want to say, uh, you know, viewing the, the last meeting, you asked, you know, what our strengths and what our weaknesses were. And I just want to say uh, one of my weaknesses is uh, legal. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, just being with the planning board for, for six years, I know, you know, relying on the town, uh, you know, council attorney was just came into play so often. And, you know, I'm sure that we're just, that's just going to be a huge input. Uh, for whatever we do. Yep. Uh, Chris, did you have a, uh, your hand up? Yeah, I was just wondering if this group would like me to try to get, or like Stephanie and me to get um, someone from KP Law to come and give a short presentation about, you know, what they've seen in terms of what um, what is supported and what's not supported as far as, you know, towns regulating solar. Is that something that you'd be interested in? And if so, I can ask, um, Yeah, we can ask the town manager if we can go ahead and schedule something like that. Sure, I, I see some oh, thumbs up and I would put my thumb up on that one as well. Um, maybe, maybe in, in, well, you work it out with the town manager and then, and then KP Law in terms of when that might uh, be available to us. I, I would think maybe, you know, in two or three meetings from now would be really mm -hmm. timely. Mm -hmm. Stephanie. First, we have to get the permission by the town manager, and then I'll get in touch with you in terms of timing. Great. And, and Martha, I see if you're hesitating, I think, but. Uh, yeah, well, I just say that uh, the three model bylaws that we reviewed, they were certainly all well aware of uh, MGL uh, 40 section three. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, they did lay out a whole slew of, of types of things that we could include in our bylaws. So I think that uh, we, we shouldn't be, you know, hugely overly concerned. I think that we should go ahead with uh, you know, modeling a, a bylaw after the types of environmental concerns and uh, so on, and, you know, possibility of setbacks and, you know, possibility of, of sizes and so on. I think it's the main concern really is uh, what areas of town, Chris's whole, um, you know, talk that we're going to hear about, about our zoning uh, layouts and so on, uh, I think is the important thing in discussing what areas of town would uh, be related to what kind of requirements and so on, but we, I, I, I just don't think that we should be, uh, you know, as I said before, spooked by these these court cases. I think I would agree with Janet that the ones from the Supreme Judicial Court were really rather extreme examples. Great. Okay. Any more? Um... Uh, comment or discussion on uh, on the um, legal issues uh, and the land court decisions. And, and again, thank you to Laura for her um, summary. Great. Okay, uh, that's really helpful discussion. Um, and, and thank you. Um, let's turn to the next agenda item. And I do see Mike Warner. Um, if if you're can confirm that you're ready. Um, I, I am here and ready. Okay. Yes. Uh, we're a little bit before one o'clock when, when you, you said you would be ready, but uh, great to have you uh, join us. Uh, so, um, Mike, you can introduce yourself, but um, Mike, Mike uh, is going to uh, give us a, a, a tutorial, if you will, 
uh, an overview of the uh, GIS mapping tool uh, um, uh, that's available. And I think something that we can actually use ourselves publicly, um, uh, but he'll walk us through that. Um, and again, the, the idea here, a little bit departure of what the agenda has is that Mike's gonna walk us through um, the tool, how to use it, uh, what it does and so forth. Uh, and then um, and that'll be today. And then uh, I, I think next meeting, assuming Chris can make it, uh, she will uh, walk us through and give us this sort of a, a 101 on land use in, 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 in the town or using, using the maps that um, she has available, planning maps. Okay, so Mike, uh, uh, sure. you can take it from here. Yeah, well, hi folks. My name is Mike Warner. Um, I'm with the IT department here uh, for the town of Amherst and um, I wear a lot of different hats, but one of my areas of expertise is in a technology that's called geographic information systems, which is um, a fancy way of saying mapping things. Um, and, and all of the data that lives behind those things that we map. Um, we have a, a very robust um, uh, GIS, GIS here in Amherst um, that's been built and developed over the last 25 years or so. Um, and it's just being built upon and built upon and built upon. And my predecessor um, and then me have kind of just constantly been building and throwing things and making things available to the public, um, not just to Amherst residents, but to members of the public around the world. Um, and so what I'm going to show today is our um, Amherst Maps viewer. And I'm not 100% convinced that it's gonna be the tool that you guys are gonna want, um, but maybe I can show it to you and then you folks can say, hey, we're gonna need something custom for what we're trying to accomplish. Um, Cause just from reading your email yesterday, Dwayne, that was kind of where my brain started heading. Um, <clears throat> But, and then the big thing is don't expect to remember, or write everything down here that we go over and discuss today. I'll try to send a follow-up email to Chris and Stephanie and Dwayne that he can then share with you folks about how to access this stuff and how to get around, if that makes sense. So unless anybody has a problem, I will jump right in and start sharing my screen. All right. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, I'm going to go to a web browser. I'm gonna open, I always use Google Chrome personally, but I'm opened Google Chrome on my computer here and I'm going to go to gis.amherstma gov gis stands for geographic information systems and when i go there it takes me to this nice little landing page um, and what most people do is they come here to look up information about their property their assessed value and things like that of their home but i'm showing you this because this little button right here is a really nice friend it says townwide map and when you click on townwide map it kind of bypasses you having to look up your property or a specific address or anything, and it zooms you to the entire town. So it's a nice, good starting point um, for everyone. Um, and feel free to interrupt me at any point in time if somebody wants to say, okay, wait, hey, how did you do that? Or how do we do this? Um, so when you get to this tool, um, you can, with your mouse or if you're using a laptop or with your phone, you can click to zoom in. Um, and then these over here on the upper left corner, there's um, a zoom out button. That's a little minus symbol that you can click on to kind of zoom out. Um, and you can click and grab and move around the town with this little hand icon. Um, and I think one of the things that you folks were looking at is, is land that's currently protected by conservation, right? And like all the different types of conservation and wetlands, like all, we have a lot of protected land in Amherst that's non-developable. Um, so 
we have these nice shortcuts that I'll be sending to Dwayne that he can share with all of you to our conservation map, to our zoning map for the entire town so that you'll be able to zoom in and zoom out if you have a particular property that you're interested in looking at and quickly looking at the zoning map for that area or quickly looking at the conservation map for that area. Um, and on the conservation map, you'll see all these different colors and shapes. And those are um, visible in the legend over here as conservation areas or chapter lands or AP agricultural protect, um, protected land or subdivision open space or conservation restrictions. Or, and I think one of the things you mentioned, Dwayne, was institutional lands, like lands that the colleges own, or the colleges or universities own, correct? Um, so that is also over here in the legend and is represented by the purple, the pink, and the maroon colors here. So as you can see, just when you're looking at land that is protected under conservation, a lot of Amherst is covered. <laughs> um, so I'll be sending the conservation link to you, the, zo the zoning link to you, and then the overall kind of um, um, map that's more simple that doesn't have any of these colorful things on it so that you can pan around and zoom around. Um, so is there, is there a particular property that you folks would like to take a look at to investigate a little bit? Or is there, um, what other functions would you like folks like to see? Um, I would like to see um, the agricultural soils, like how they're rated. I know, I think Chris has said that there, we have a map where prime soils are distinguished from, you know, soils of statewide interest. Um, do we have a map that just is where our best soils are versus our average soils? So that is not a layer that's maintained by the town. That is a layer that's maintained by um, the State Geological Survey. Um, and in some cases by the federal government. Um, and historically, we would load those things in here, but that became very painful to manage because they would never let us know when they updated things. <laughs> um, <laughs> so <clears throat> we've peeled back loading those data layers that we do not own into this viewer. Um, but that I will make a note of that. So you're talking about, I know exactly the layer that you're referring to um, and see if that's something that maybe we can get in here or build as a, um, a customized thing for you folks. Mm -hmm. Is there some, are there other layers that you don't do for the same reason that we might be interested in? Oh my gosh, that is a, very big a question. question. <laughs> like, the, like the bio. Oh, sorry, I, didn't to, I didn't mean to ask a giant one. <laughs> what was that, Martha? I heard you say uh, something. The, the, the bio map. Isn't there a state bio map? Exactly. So yeah, ex simple or complex? Um, <laughs> each one of those things, there's complicated issues with each, with integrating each one of those into kind of the because the town doesn't own that stuff right those aren't the town's layers the town doesn't maintain them um and a lot of times the state doesn't allow you to tap directly into that so that if the state makes an update we would see it here and what started happening is our stuff would be out of date with the state's stuff mm -hmm. and then it would become a problem because mm -hmm. people would start saying you know <laughs> i looked at the biomap and i can build this and then you look at the state's layer and it's up to date and you can't do anything there. So um, so th I imagine that there's a lot of things that you folks would want that um, are not going to be available here because they are state or federal okay. things. Mm -hmm. But you can certainly make a list of, we can make a list of things and we can grab them from sources and pull them together in a tool that you folks could use. Oh, that'd be nice. I, I have another question I hope isn't hard. Um, if, sure. I, if I went onto this map and just clicked on things that are permanently protected, like not chapter 61A lands, mm -hmm. EDU and things like that, could I do that? 
Um, we have different filters. Um, you're asking really good questions. That's a really good question. Um, so Chris, what would be a, an example of something that is permanently protected? Like APR land, I think, or... Um... APR, APR land and town conservation land are both um, right. permanently protected. Yeah. So there is the ability to come in here and um, we can, I'm going to select every parcel in town that is a town conservation land um, and watch it crash the map. <laughs> 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 That's too much data. Um, but it will think and it will select every piece of property that is town conservation land and it will populate that in a list over on the left hand side and it will you know give you the information about each one of those so um, that's um town owned land town conservation land then there's also land in town that has conservation restrictions and that can be privately owned but the state or the town owns a conservation restriction right. on it so exactly. those are kind of separate from town owned conservation lands Exactly. So, um, so I can come in here and let me do town conservation areas. So here's a hundred. There's 155 parcels, and they'll eventually select over here on the right hand side. Um, so what I can do is I can build these filters for you, and like I said, I was going to send you a link for. Um, the zoning map and the conservation map, I can send you an, a map that's already, hey, here's all the, here's, you click on this link and you're going to get a map of all the land that's, all the parcels that are in the conservation area or all the land parcels that are, conser that are APR. Um, it's going to be a lot. <laughs> so, Chris, can you help me? So, there could be town owned land that is being held for conservation purposes but there's not a conservation restriction or an APR. And some of those lands, like are there town lands that we're saving for conservation, but you could put solar on it? Cause I know you can't do that on APR land. I don't know the answer to that question. Stephanie may know because she worked in the works in the conservation department. Um, but if a, if a property, what I know is if a property is in private conservation, there's a conservation restriction that is filed with the state and it has uh, limits on what can be done there other than just allowing, you know, what is growing there to continue to grow. Um, I think different pieces of property have different types of restrictions on them. So we would have to look at the particular restriction that is on a particular property. And then for town conservation land, I think that's all covered by what is called chapter 97. Um, and that governs conservation restrictions. So, um, you know, we, we would be able to look at what, what kinds of restrictions are there under chapter 97. Um, but again, Stephanie would be the person who would be most knowledgeable about that. Okay. I would add to that just that um, conservation land can't be developed without some act of release by the legislature. Okay. So yeah. it's not an it's not automatically and it's not it's not easy to do. I would and we're say. talking about the state legislature, not a the town state, council. Correct. State legislature. Correct. Well, I think actually the town council also has to rule as mm -hmm. well as the state leg legislature. So it has to go through both channels. Okay. Um, and I wanted to note that Jack has had his hand up for quite a while, Dwayne. <laughs> Sorry, yep, yep, I saw that. And Jack, go ahead, please. Yeah, I just want to uh, go back to uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission resource again. Uh, I, I'm sure uh, Mike probably knows. Do you know Doug Hall? I do, yep. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, they have a great you know data uh, based for the Pioneer Valley. Uh, it's pioneervalleydata.org. If anybody wants to go there, uh, it's useful. But from my time with the planning board, uh, well, my time with the Pine Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, uh, I can say that Amherst has the most protective land of any community in the entire Pioneer Valley. So that uh, that's gonna you know gonna be a, a challenge. I think 
but it should be recognized how much protected land Amherst has. Great. Laura. Can I ask a question? Hey, can you just go through um, the layers that you have available mm -hmm. um, for this map again so I can take a look? For the conservation map specifically or? No, you know, I'm interested in seeing, I know that when we, we built a map um, very similar for Virginia with the Department of Mines, Minerals and Energy years ago, mm -hmm. And we, we had layers that I found very useful, like of endangered or threatened species, um, habitat like that, which I think, you know, is critical um, mm -hmm. to citing any sort of um, commercial project. Right. Do we have those kinds of layers here. So those are layers that are maintained by the state. Again, um, you know, we don't have like a, a wildlife biologist who's going around for that it's employed by the town who's going around and doing that um can so we, can we get that layer from them to we can it? yep okay. we can and then you know so we're it's also let's see that is just, you know it's it's so helpful and i feel like even from a perspective of smart solar development those are the types of things that um i feel like we should really be looking at too yeah absolutely so um, I don't know in, um, if anybody is familiar with MassGIS, but MassGIS is the, the data repository for the entire state um, and just has, is one of the best statewide resources mm -hmm. when it comes to geospatial information mm -hmm. um, in, the, in the entire country. They do an incredible job pulling everything together and making it visible in one space. Um, so mass GIS, you can, you can pick your town. Um, or you can just zoom to your town, either one. Um, and then over here on the, the right hand side in my zoom window might be blocking everything. Um, let's see. Uh -huh. um, what would it be under? So here's biomap. Here's the biomap stuff. Here's vernal pools. Uh, here's NHESP Good. priority habitats of rare species, yep. rare wildlife. Um, again, this we don't maintain these layers. The the it's maintained by and we could grab those and pull them in. But my concern at the local level is I never know when this stuff is updated. Yeah. So you that's we could be working with data that's a year old. Sure. And meanwhile, the state has updated their stuff. So I try to not pull that stuff into mm -hmm. the local place. Mm -hmm. I try to refer people to this so that you're looking at the true source of things. Got it. Which, which would, it means that you folks and your team, you're looking at lots of different things mm -hmm. instead of one, one tool. Um, but at least you know that you're looking at the authoritative source mm -hmm. and you're not looking at something that's out of date. Got it. No, that makes sense. And I think we have great sources, you know, in testing for vernal pools via the Conservation Commission. You know, and that's something that we do all the time. But things like, um, you know, priority habitats, endangered birds, you know, things like that, um, it's not really in our purview. So I think that's an important um, layer to some at some point include in the bylaws. So here I, I just turned on the priority habitats. And as you see, I mean, it's, it's kind of tough to visualize it, but with a customized tool that I could potentially build for you, if we came up with a list of, um, okay, these are state layers that we would like to pull in. Um, mm -hmm. I can see, I can work, I have some contacts who work with MassGIS. I can see if they can provide me a way to tap directly into mm -hmm. stuff so that we wouldn't have wouldn't have a lag between the data that they have that's updated and what we're seeing visually on a map. But it's, I imagine it's going to be a lot of layers. <laughs> I think that you folks are gonna to wanna to see. And I mean, um, you know, my thought is also, this is gonna, um, some, some of this, and I'm not sure whether the, the, sol the solar assessment consultant is also, is, is gonna be digging into this GIS work as well, or these GIS, resources as well in terms of uh, 
you know, their work to provide a, a technical assessment of, of uh, the um, where solar might, you know, might be might be good fits in Amherst, not so much from a zoning perspective, but just by a physical um, land perspective and working with these layers uh, to recognize where solar just legally can't go. Um, um, and uh, and and give us give, inform. Uh, you know, our job is more not so much that technical potential, but then you know, based on priorities of the town and constituents of of saying where solar um, should be, should and should not be able to go, um, based on zoning rules, not so much um, uh, legal rules associated with uh, with the way that the state regulates solar. Um, so um, I think we'll also be getting a lot of information and visuals, uh, mapping type of visuals from, from the solar assessment study as well, in terms of uh, how solar <clears throat> um, layer lays on mm -hmm. and overlaps uh, or, or um, uh, of what, you know, it maps onto, onto the land use and, and land uh, characteristics that we have in Amherst. Sure. So just yeah. So you folks have hired a consultant who's going to be doing this work, who's going to be doing this work for you or well, the town has, the, or the town has. <laughs> yeah. So one thing in this was a Stephanie or Chris thing, probably um, one thing to be really aware of folks is um, when that consultant is wanting to do this work, we need to make sure that they have, you know, that they reach out and that they get copies of our data. Right. Copies of, you know, I should probably have a, a one on one phone conversation with the with the geospatial expert for the consulting firm it, to see what what they want and what they what they've used in other communities. And because we're going to have local layers that are far more granular and detailed yeah. than what they should be would be grabbing from the state or from any other source that they could have. So that would be one. That would be one thing that I would say. Hey, if 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 you get the sense that they're actually going to start start doing the research, um, we should probably talk. Great, and and um, yeah, you, you'll. It's really going to be town driven, Mike, in terms of mm -hmm. the work of the consultants. Um, and Stephanie, do you want to um, comment on that? <clears throat> or yes, I just wanted to say that at least for the solar assessment, um, it's written into the assessment. Uh, RFP that they would be working with our GIS staff. So that's you, okay. Mike. <laughs> Excellent. I learned that today. <laughs> Surprise. Yeah. yeah. We'll have a new friend. Yeah, yeah there we go. <laughs> and that's good. Okay. This looks like an awesome tool for us, Mike, and really appreciate it. It seems like actually both the Amherst tool and the Mass GIS tool, just from your quick review of it, both seem fairly useful and you and relatively user friendly um for us um and 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 your offer to potentially merge the two as needed in terms of the data from mass gis into the into the town one to do more customized work is is uh sounds sounds yeah because because what ends up happening when you do studies and analyses like this and i've i've done this this type of consulting work before is, you know, you start out with the shape of the entire town and you start plucking pieces away, right? Okay, you can't do something here because of reason A and you can't build something there because of reason B. And at the very, before you know it, there's two or three tiny little spots <laughs> all over town that you can actually do something in. Um, so it's, it's very complicated. And, you know, I think, I think unless um, you're super comfortable with mapping programs, it's going to be tricky to navigate with more than one tool. Um, mm. It's it's nice to see everything superimposed on yeah. top of one another. Yeah. Um, so I think that's probably ideally what we should work towards. Um, you know, but it would be really helpful if you folks interact with Stephanie and. Um, um, and Chris, like Laura, the, the examples that you gave of, and, and Janet, the examples you gave of soils data and Laura of, you know, habitat information, you know, start just thinking about that and making a list of things that would be nice to see. Um, and we can start tracking that down and seeing if we can pull it together in all, in, all in one resource. 
That's uh, great, and really appreciate that offer, uh, Mike. Uh, really helpful. Um, okay, did you have anything else um, that you wanted to offer to us, or um, uh, this has been great? No, other than I will send links to what we have now, what we have available, which are these tools and and the and MassGIS, and I'll probably send some PBTA stuff as well uh, for, for Jack's reference if I can find something that I'm that I think would be of value. And I'll send that to Stephanie, Chris, and Dwayne, and then you folks can share it out with the rest of the group Great. so that people can start poking around and thinking about things. Can, can I ask one question about endangered species? I know that um, federal and state agencies don't like to specify exactly where a species is because of like, weirdly, collectors. <laughs> so just like, you're like, oh, it's really rare. I want to go kill it um, and capture it. I don't get that. But so the natural like that information will be captured like this is an area of something rare like you know plants or birds or whatever that will be there but it won't be specific right is that am i correct 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 okay. and it's usually very generalized like um and you can't like i can't rem i don't think you can like click on it and say oh it's this rare beetle lives here or something it's just kind of like in on the amherst college campus mm -hmm. There's something unique there. <laughs> it, would just, it would just require further studies, really. So if there's like, if it's in the general vicinity, we'd have to make sure that it was looked at more closely. Right? right. Like all of, it's really hard to see with the colors of this map here, but like all of Lawrence Swamp and South Amherst, the entire breadth of it, all the way from the Belcher Town Town Line, all the way up to the Fort River, and then all the way over to the Hadley Town Line, it's all... Um, NHESP priority habitat and estimated habitat of rare species. So good luck traversing that and finding that beetle that you're looking for <laughs> and that you're hunting. I did see one, one bird. Yeah. I got a glimpse, I got a glimpse once. <laughs> okay. All right, excellent. Okay, any last uh, comments or questions for Mike? No, thank you. All right, folks, we'll reach out um, to Stephanie or Chris with, with direct questions and awesome. they'll forward them along to me and we'll get back and forth with you, okay? Thanks, Mike. Thanks, right, Mike. Yeah, thank you, Mike. All right, bye. All right, excellent. Um, okay, I think we're doing uh, pretty good on time as well. Um, and uh, we'll move on to the next agenda item. Uh, which is for me to um, offer up uh, what I came up with, with regard to uh, sort of thoughts on a, uh, 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 just to help us map out uh, what we need to accomplish over what time frame and to some extent what resources we have to work with. Um, and we can have, uh, uh, talk a little bit about what I see as these major chunks of work um, and uh, have some discussion on that, but then maybe also uh, we'll then distribute this around in the in the um, uh, to everybody, uh, and then uh, we can um, continue a discussion, maybe hone in and, and finalize uh, a work plan for the ten months that we have or whatever um, at the next meeting. Um, so let me um, bring that up on my screen, and then share it with everybody here. Um, you know, I do a lot of a lot of work on uh, projects and so forth, but I'm not I'm not like a, a an expert on on project management, if you will. So I, I use a fairly simple way to mind map my my uh, my projects, just in terms of a fairly simple spreadsheet uh, to visualize, help visualize where what we need to uh, accomplish. So uh, that was sort of my method of um, of of uh, uh, choice. Uh, to sort of just lay this out in, in, in a spreadsheet, if you will. Um, and let me just uh, restructure my screen here a little bit so I see everybody. Okay, so here I have um, a work plan uh, and, a, and, a, and a work plan in terms of uh, sort of key activities, which I can walk through just quickly. Uh, and then over the, um, um, I'm not sure how many months we have, but until uh, May, is basically where when the um, our charge says that we will 
um, present our recommendations for bylaws uh, to the town council, at least by the end of May. Uh, so we got we got this time uh, left. I, I sort of started in, in August uh, and uh, uh, and then sort of tried to think about what are the key um, activities and issues we need to deal with. So uh, that's what I list here and I can go over those relatively quickly, but then give people time a quick discussion maybe on it now, but then give people time to to um, cogitate on it uh, and then bring it up for um, revisions and, and uh, uh, advice and suggestions for next meeting. Um, so here first um, is where, and, and some of this relates to conversations we've already had, uh, which is helpful. Uh, my sense here is, is uh, sort of starting off as we start off here, uh, we're reviewing uh, the model bylaws, um, and but we also have to start thinking about, um, as came up already today, sort of gathering technical um, uh, background and technical information on, on, on things that we recognize is going to be important for us in terms of solar development, um, storage issues, uh, storage uh, as well, and, and land use issues. Uh, this is all sort of really about um, gathering information. Um, as we've sort of noted today, we uh, sort of recognize there is a rhyme and reason and, and sort of some consistency with regard to the structuring of these bylaws. Um, I liked, I think it was Janet's um, thought of, of uh, this being sort of the skeleton of our, of our uh, bylaw that we need to write. To some extent, we can almost write that now uh, based on these models. Uh, and maybe, maybe that's worthwhile thinking about, but my idea here was to sort of just at least outline uh, what these uh, made these uh, bylaw sections uh, should be, and um, and sort of in that process, um, not jump not yet jump into all the deliberations and research that we need to do, but at least identify uh, the key um, issues and uh, and criteria and standards that we have to deliberate on that we want to deliberate. We feel like they're worthy enough. There's probably be a lot of things in these bylaws that we can just sort of settle on. They seem pretty standard, but then there's going to be a subset uh, that are going to be the ones that, um, in my mind, we need to focus on uh, and deliberate on and gather more technical information on and maybe uh, make use of the technical consultant uh, to, to help us. Uh, but this process here in, in, over this uh, sort of time frame, September, October, would not necessarily be to make all those decisions, but identify the big areas that we, uh, the key areas that we want to deliberate on, and 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 research further. Um, uh, we want to, um, uh, and down here are the two two uh, sort of resources that we have working in parallel with us. Uh, one is the solar assessment uh, consultant study that we'll talk about a little bit in a moment, and the second is as. Um, uh, Chris had mentioned the the uh, technical consultant um, that's um, serving the town, but but uh, is really uh, helping uh, us as a body in addition to the planning department uh, with regard to uh, um, un, uh, coming up with with these uh, recommended bylaws. Uh, so we, for for the solar consultant, um, as they come on board and begin uh, start to begin their work, there will be um, an opportunity uh, to um, help to prepare and provide. Um, uh, input on the solar assessment, um, and particularly regarding uh, one of their tasks uh, of the solar consultant is to engage with the community uh, to identify priorities. And I think, you know, we would uh, have the opportunity uh, to provide some input into uh, our ideas of how the consultant uh, might go about um, uh, uh, going about uh, uh, doing that assessment of, uh, of the community uh, community engagement and, and priorities. Um, towards the end of the of the uh, solar consultants work, uh, we'll have the opportunity to, to re review uh, what they've come up with uh, in terms of the solar assessment and the uh, and the outcomes of the community engagement uh, effort that they um, have provided. Um, that may be in the form of reviewing their their findings and their report. Um, they're going to be um, uh, we we don't, don't won't necessarily have the opportunity to engage with them on a on a um, frequent basis at all, uh, given given their their um, budget and, and time time frame. Um, then this is sort of in my mind somewhat of the the crux of uh, of what we're uh, going to be needing to work on is really 
deliberating um, after we sort of identify the areas and start doing some research, uh, deliberating, evaluating, and, and deciding on the bylaw criteria and standards that we want to put forward as recommendations in, in our uh, in our uh, bylaw draft. Uh, this would take course um, uh, roughly in this this time frame. Uh, then with with help and, and maybe uh, even leadership of the planning department uh, staff uh, is to uh, draft the bylaws um, and um, work with them with regard to incorporating uh, some of our um, recommendations. Um, that would take place sort of uh, after this point, after we're in the process of deliberating and making decisions on those recommendations. Um, again, I think up to up to Chris and her and her leadership of that department, they may be starting to draft some of this uh, ahead of time. But this is when we could get uh, more engaged. Um, uh, re review uh, here we have re review the solar assessment mapping again as as uh, Mike just laid out and we just discussed also the solar consultant is going to use this GIS mapping uh, exercise to develop maps of of uh, uh, of not necessarily where solar should go, but just technically, potentially could go um, uh, with regard to not just the unbuilt environment, but also importantly, the built environment. Um, and um, uh, and we'll be in, in, uh, in, the, uh, 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 in a position to uh, really review uh, that, their reports um, and their uh, mapping exercise as, uh, as that will be critical to inform our work. Um, then we need to, uh, as per our charge, uh, but uh, but really with the help of um, of uh, uh, staff at the in the planning department, primarily I, I think, uh, is to uh, you know prepare a report on the process and and uh, and guidance uh, for solar siting permit permitting and construction that is part of the zoning. Uh, bylaws in my mind, uh, but maybe separate from the the specific uh, uh, standards and uh, criteria that are in the bylaws, uh, in the zoning bylaw, and then um, uh, and we'll get help help from the planning department in uh, preparing that report, uh, and then um, you know ultimately all sort of uh, getting to the end result of a of a of a zoning bylaw um, coming out of this body uh, that can be provided as a recommendation to the town council. Um, so let me, uh, and just, you know, again, we have the solar consultant that's gonna have a six month window uh, to perform their work. We'll talk a little bit about their scope in a moment, uh, but um, my guess, uh, maybe, maybe that might uh, be available even starting sometime in August, but after contract, you know, all that, let's think about starting and, you know, might start about September and have sort of this six month window. Uh, and then the, uh, we talked about the solar uh, consultant that uh, the RFQ is being prepared now. And so maybe that work starts a little bit earlier, uh, but um, uh, we have to sort of incorporate and think about um, uh, what we want, what we, um, what input we might want to provide through me uh, to in terms of the scope of work for the uh, for that technical consultant for the bylaw. Uh, so let me um, pause there uh, and see if um, any thoughts or comments uh, or suggestions on that. Um, and um, uh, and let me and and then we can uh, again we'll distribute this um, to everybody and take it up again at the next meeting uh, to to sort of. Uh, conclude, sort of come to some conclusion on this work plan. Uh, but let me um, open it to Chris. Thank you. So um, thanks for doing this, Dwayne. This is really excellent, a good guide um, for what we're going to be doing. Um, so I had two comments or questions, and one of them has to do with um, item number. It's it's listed on column or uh, row nine. Yeah. It's not really item number nine, but it says identify priorities. We have also talked about identifying values. Okay. And um, I think that's an important word to stick in here. Um, and it relates to, you know, we have a value that we 
want to preserve forests, we have a value that we want to preserve farmland, but we also have a value that we want to um, make sure that Amherst is um, going to be, uh, what, what do you call it, carbon neutral by 2050, yeah. mm -hmm. and that we have, you know, adequate um, solar arrays to move ourselves along to that goal. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think you could argue that those are priorities, but I also think they're values. So I just wanted to stick that word in there because I think it's important. Um, yep. The other thing I wanted to ask about is, um, or, or say that I think particularly with the planning board, the planning board is gonna have to hold a public hearing on this if it's a zoning bylaw. And I think it would be a good idea to keep the planning board informed as we move along so they're not surprised at the end and don't just have something dropped on them by town council. That um, happened sometimes last year when we were working at a very rapid pace on zoning bylaws, um, that something would arrive at town council, be referred for public hearings, and all of a sudden the planning board would go well, like, where did this come from? So. Yeah. I think it's um, it's a good idea, and I'll talk to the planning board chair about, you know, updating the planning board. Of course, Janet will be yes. doing that as part of her report, <clears throat> but it may also be <coughs> worthwhile to show them drafts of things as we're moving through this. So that was my comment, and and I wondered if possibly the Conservation Commission would be in a similar position, even though they don't have to hold a public hearing in the end, but we probably want to keep them informed about what we're doing too. Yeah, that's really, really helpful. Thank you. Um, and yeah, uh, definitely um, let let me know, particularly um, uh, when you think it might be worthwhile junctures or, or Janet uh, with regard to providing information, any any drafts we have up to, up to that point to the planning department or conservation department. Um, or, or if there's even a need or, or interest in, in presenting to them um, at one of their meetings. Great. Uh, yes, Stephanie, and then we'll go to Jack. Thanks, Dwayne. Um, yes, there will be a process for other um, departments and boards to review this document as we go forward. So I, you know, especially the Energy and Climate Action Committee very much are interested in the language of this bylaw. So I think they will want to weigh in as well. So I do think um, there'll be more of a process for that kind of broad dissemination. And that's something I would help coordinate. Great, thank you. Jack? Yeah, I was just gonna say that uh, it seems like the solar assessment you know, study um, is most critical. I mean, it 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 brings, uh, you know, everything specific to the town here because that's our town is different than every other town, and I'm just you know, and I know it's largely a a, a GIS uh, effort, and I'm just wondering, you know, why it's going to take so long because it seems like that should be done, you know, much sooner. So we can, you know, have more productive uh, conversations uh, and work on the bylaw itself. Um, yep. Well, I think it, it's um, as we'll discuss in a moment on that. I mean, it, it the RQ has just gone out now, so I think it's reasonable to assume that it'll be a few weeks at least before somebody well uh, for responses and then and then to get somebody contracted. Um, will be about a, a month or more, maybe. Um, uh, I guess your question, Jack, is, is does it need to take six months? <laughs> um, and um, uh, we'll go, maybe we can defer that conversation when we get to the solar assessment, because uh, you know there's a, a fair amount of scope that the, the, the uh, consultants being asked to, to provide, including this community engagement um, and outreach, uh, in addition to the, the mapping exercise, if you will, uh, and then some analysis with that mapping. So um, um, I, we, we can let's discuss that when we look at the scope of work. Yeah, uh, Janet, sorry. Does Stephanie want to go first? 
or is she, is that a, okay. No, nope, that's okay. I just lowered my hand. So I think we should pull out the community engagement process from the um, solar assessment, um, because I think that it seems to me as part of the community engagement process, people are gonna wanna know, um, you know, the information in the assessment. And so that just seems like it's, you know, it might be overlapping, but it seems like people, you know, knowing this town and how much we crave information, I think that's sort of a separate piece uh, of the puzzle. I also, from reading the, um, from our charge, I thought that that was a piece of the puzzle that we would be working much more on. And I think it's fantastic to work with a consultant on that. And I looked at the RFP very quickly. And if they have that experience, I think it'd be great. But I saw our group is having a lot more input in that process. Um, so I'm not sure, but so I, I, guess, I guess I think it's a separate piece and the timing might be changed and the who does what or how, my question would be is like, how would we work effectively with the consultant to make sure, you know, um, the values of the community are being properly identified? Um, so that's one piece. Um, we're also supposed to provide a map um, about showing sites that are suitable for, are su considered suitable for large scale solar, large scale ground mounted solar arrays. And I think that I took that as a separate issue, not just saying, where could they possibly go? But where do we think, do we as a group, as a working group, think it's suitable? Um, and I, you know, not technically suitable, but in terms of the community values. And so I just wanted to bring that up as another um, kind of deliverable that our group needs to show to town council. Um, and so those are two pieces. Yeah, let's, uh, Martha. Oh, yes. Well, first, let me say, I think this is terrific, Dwayne. I think you've given us a, just a wonderful, you know, map here of our whole process all the way from start to finish. So congratulations for your work here. Uh, but I, one thing I, I don't see specifically, I wonder if we wanted to, to call it out somewhere to review, is reviewing our town's master plan and the ECAC's um, CARP the climate action plan. I mean, these were both plans put together with a lot of community input and representing community values as well as, you know, the work to be done. And I wonder uh, if we should um, have a review of those sometime. Uh, and then just one other thing I would just add to what Janet said, and I really think that we should work together with the consultants in, in planning outreach forums and so on, because that's a very important aspect that we are really charged with, as well as um, having the consultants uh, work on. And, and maybe in this, uh, you know, Jack was saying, this is a sort of a long time for the consultants to be working, but maybe part of that would be uh, in order to interact with us and, and, and sort of mutually agree on how these forums might be handled. Yep, Stephanie. Thank you, Duane. Um, the Energy and Climate Action Committee um, will actually be involved in this process as well. So um, I think guidance from the CARP will mainly come from them. So I don't, I guess just thinking that you all have so much that you are looking at and referring to, um, it's not that you shouldn't, but I think they're gonna make very specific recommendations based on that document and their work. So I just wanted to provide that feedback. I'm sorry, what document? The um, Climate Adaptation and Resilience Plan, affectionately known as the CARP. <laughs> and that's, and can... that's yeah that that was an output of a, of the ECAC uh, and a consultant that worked with the ECAC with ECAC uh, that I, I would agree with Janet that's a resource we should all be familiar with um, I'm not sure if we need to put it on our work plan per se but maybe we can uh -huh. add it well it's on the town website already but maybe it should go in our resource uh, set of documents as sure. well so I can people add it. have, have uh -huh. easy access to it. I'll also do the same for the master plan as well. Okay, great, yeah. 
All right, great. Anything else, Stephanie? I, you, I still have your hand up, but I, I couldn't remember if that was a new one or no. Okay, and then uh, Chris, if that's a new hand up. I just wanted to mention that um, once a year we're required to have a forum on mass on the master plan. So oh. I have sort of a quick presentation that I give at the forum. I could give it to this group if this group is interested, or you could just attend the forum, which usually happens in the fall. So just wanted to put that out there that there is, you know, kind of a quick overview of it. And I could give that to you if you're interested. Great. I think is that is that I, I'm not sure if we want to take up your time and, and the right. um, working group time. Is that something that would be available sort of in a PowerPoint as well that we could just add to our resource? Yes, it's resources? available in a PowerPoint and it's also the forum occurs at a town council meeting. So you guys, could okay. you, you guys, I shouldn't say it that way. <laughs> you could tune in to the town council meeting where they talk about this. If awesome. you okay. to. So maybe you can give us an update when, when that's scheduled. Um, yep. So we, we um, are alerted to that when, when that, when the fall comes <laughs> sooner or later. Yep. Janet. Um, so I was also going to say, I hope we don't just rest our um, looking at community values at two forms, but um, try to reach the different parts of the community, maybe with the survey, um, talk to our community participation officers, and um, hopefully the consultant will have more ways to reach out to people than hoping that people will come to like one or two meetings. So I think that's actually recommended by your institute, um, Dwayne, too. So just just adding that. Yeah, and th I think this is one of the reasons why it's important that the consultant is really taking this on. Um, no offense to any any of us here in this in this working group, but we're all at least I can speak for myself. I got a I got a day job, um, and uh, um, you know, I, and nor do I have expertise in running public forum. Um, whereas the consultant, you know, part of the criteria for selection and their demonstration and their application is that they have experience in doing this type of community engagement uh, across diverse uh, portions of the community. So we are careful to um, understand the values and preferences and priorities of, of across the diverse constituents we have in Amherst, um, not those that just might happen to show up to a particular meeting, uh, and that we will have a role to play in terms of helping to uh, inform and design and 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 make suggestions to the um, consultant with regard to the types of of questions or or issues we want to bring forward, but it'll be up to them uh, to to uh, lead that uh, engagement um, uh, that, that will relate as as um, Stephanie mentioned both to this working group and to ECAC and and maybe other other um, uh, parts of the of the town. Okay, um, any other comments on that? I'm gonna stop sharing screen so we don't have to look at that anymore. Um, okay, and so I will, I, I made a few uh, adjustments. I'll, I will get this off to Stephanie um, a little bit later uh, today or maybe over the weekend. Um, and then she'll distribute this as, as a document we can all reference um, and maybe bring up for discussion at our next agenda. Um, uh, I don't want to dwell on it, but if just in case people have some comments on it, suggestions um, after having a chance to look at it a little bit um, in a little bit more uh, detail um, on their own time. Okay, uh, great. Um, let me find my agenda again. Yeah, okay, which, which does bring us to the solar assessment. Um, and um, I think maybe what I'd like to do there is keep this very terse at the moment, uh, just because we're running out of time and we do need uh, probably five minutes or so to figure out when we're gonna meet next. Uh, and then I do wanna leave time for any public comment. Um, so uh, I think we talked a little bit about, we've talked on and off about the solar assessment. It's a theme that runs throughout uh, today's discussion. Um, what I what I uh, like to say is that it, it it's it's um, going to be a really helpful uh, um, effort that the town is is uh, uh, conducting uh, both for this group for the town as a whole and and for ECAC and others 
Um, and and um, uh, again, it's going to be a, an assessment that looks at um, both the built environment and the unbuilt environment um, and the uh, 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 maybe not built environment, but but disturbed environments. Uh, so a range of of, uh, uh, of of the full range of of opportunities for uh, solar pot pot technical potential uh, to give us and and constituents around the town uh, a sense of um, of what we're talking about in terms of, uh, of of the solar opportunities in in town, uh, both um, in in the undeveloped and, and and the built environment. Um, it will also, uh, in terms of the scope of work, uh, we'll also then uh, go into this community en engagement um, activity, uh, informed by others, as we've talked about, uh, to um, provide um, this information, uh, not only to us, but the, the town and the town staff and the town manager uh, with regard to what can be gleaned from the uh, values um, and, and uh, I like that word, Chris, values and, and, and priorities and, and preferences of the town constituents. Again, making sure to the extent possible to really try to do a, um, make sure that we have a, a, um, a, a fair and, and broad um, and, and reasonable statistical <laughs> um, uh, um, uh, um, information across, across all the diversity that we have in, in town, including, uh, including residents and businesses. Um, and, um, and then in addition, one of the exercises using this GIS mapping uh, that the consultants will, will provide is, um, again, not to suggest that uh, any bo anybody within the town is um, uh, urging <laughs> uh, or, or um, suggesting that the town should um, um, host a certain amount of capacity in Amherst. But just as an exercise of trying to figure out what would it mean if we were to host a certain amount of, of, of capacity in town, uh, where what would that really mean in terms of the landscape, land use, and and uh, and distribution of solar around town? Uh, so with input from uh, ECAC, I believe, uh, and others, um, there will be um, asked for the consultants to look at a couple different scenarios of uh, of what would uh, what might solar look like in Amherst if we were to do X, Y, and Z amount of megawatts? Uh, and there's no single answer to that. It could be all on buildings, potentially, unless we maximize the amount that's available on buildings, uh, or it could be all in the forest. Uh, we're not suggesting that, you know, that the exercise is not to suggest one's better or the other, uh, but just <clears throat> what are the various different scenarios in which uh, a certain amount of megawatts could be incorporated in town, uh, recognizing also as part of this scenario that um, there's there's different outcomes associated with different ways in which to distribute solar around Amherst in terms of what we give up in terms of uh, land use, uh, but also what, what it might cost in terms of uh, installation costs, uh, given the, the difference in, in costs associated with different types of solar. Um, and so that that's also um, uh, an exercise and, and a task that the consultant uh, consultant uh, will will provide and help to inform um, the the town and the various bodies in the town. Um, so let me ask Stephanie if she has anything to add on the cons on the uh, assessment. Uh, I don't at this time, and especially given the time of the meeting, I, I'm yeah. I'm fine to hold off. Great. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay, so let's let's leave it there at the at the moment and um, um, work on uh, just quickly if we can when we might schedule our next meeting. Uh, so far, we've done uh, every other Friday. Uh, my my problem is that next two Fridays from now I'm not available, and quite frankly, two Fridays from then I'm then I'm also not available. Um, things will change once the fall hits. Uh, but I'm. Uh, I think if we could just go one meeting at a time at this point might be the best way to go. And so I am wondering um, whether there would be an opportunity uh, instead to meet next time in two weeks, but on Thursday instead. Uh, at um, what's the at, date of that, Dwayne? That would be um, uh, the eleventh. 
I'm out of town until the 13th, starting on Tuesday. So okay, so you couldn't make it. next Friday either. Um, uh, with the exception of Laura, can anybody anybody else have a conflict with Thursday? The sorry, yeah, Thursday the 11th at noon. Okay, so that might be one option, and and apologies for that on, on for Laura. But the other option would be at least for me, just to throw out there is to go three weeks, stick with Friday the 19th at noon. Um, is there any uh, anybody who could not make it then? Cool. Um, how do people, Stephanie? Oh, I Stephanie. I won't be here. Sorry, okay. I'll be on vacation. <laughs> no, but that's okay. Chris will be here, I think, or, and we can always get IT to do the technical piece, so. Yeah. Okay. Looks like. Hey, Dan. Um, Thursday the 11th, um, I have to leave at 1.30. Thursday the 11th, you would be available 12, but only to 1.30. Okay. Mm -hmm. Could we do like 11 to 1 then? Yeah, that would be great for me. Um, let me just double check my, uh, this is the 11th. 11, wait, no, I, I apologize. Um, uh no I I I, can't, I have something 11 to 12 that is hard I can't really miss um so um how do people feel and uh I, I like the idea of waiting three weeks and we have everybody uh but ha we have a lot of work to do so two weeks might be better and miss Laura and and Dan for half an hour uh do people have a preference on that um, my preference would be the 11th because I may not be here on, on the 19th. Okay. Let's go with, uh, with the 11th at noon. Um, and apologize, Laura. Stephanie has her hand up. Okay. And, and, and it'll be recorded and, and, uh, um, yeah. Okay. Sorry, great. sorry, Duane. I know you just went through this process, but I just wanted to throw out and maybe this doesn't work for you specifically, but the possibility of the 10th from 10 from at noon. I'm tied up all day on the 10th. Okay, so never mind. Yeah. <laughs> Just thought I'd add yes, that. Never. Okay. I'm sorry, guys. I have a hard stop at two, so I have to go. Okay. Everyone. Great. And sorry to uh, go over, okay. uh, but I do want to, um, uh, for those who can stick around for sure, um, open it up for any public, any comments from the public. Um, at this point. And yes, yeah, Stephanie, you're still there to can control that. Yep. So if anyone is interested in the public of speaking, please virtually raise your hand and I'll let you know that you're unmuted. Michael? Hi guys, uh, great meeting again. I've got a number of comments. Uh, they're, they're kind of in chronological order because you just took down notes as you're doing your your meeting. Um, one thing that I hope won't get lost, and I have a feeling it won't, because I've heard Jack say it at other meetings before, when he talks about uh, monitoring construction being absolutely critical, I couldn't agree with him more. And I hope that any bylaw that you come up with has at least weekly monitoring with someone who's working for the town, but who's paid for by the contractor so that someone is looking out for the town's interest on this. Um, it's not a clerk of the works position like you'd have on a public building position, obviously, but someone who's there to look out for the town's interest because it's too easy for things to go wrong really quickly. And that should be on the tab of the contractor, not on the town. And um, I hope that'll become part of the bylaw. Um, on, the, on the comment about what's necessary to protect the public health, safety, and welfare. I think one of the big things you need to look at there is how you define the public. Um, the public in some cases can be a couple of people. It doesn't have to be you know, a, the, the entire population of Amherst. All you have to do is look at what went on with Leverett. They had a different situation, obviously. It was leaching from a landfill it's certainly not the same situation as a solar field, but in that particular case, the leaching from the landfill affected five households. Five households led to the town having to pay two and a half million dollars 
to run a water line from Amherst to Leverett. You could certainly say that that was affecting the public health, safety, and welfare, even though it was only five people on wells that happened to be located near the landfill. I'd like to see that type of situation avoided in town. And it's also interesting that that landfill was capped in 1995, and yet the issue didn't surface till many years later. And you hate to see a situation that looks okay now, it's not going to be harmful, and then learn five, 10 years down the road that it is harmful and it's affecting the wells of, of just a handful of people that happen to be close to a solar installation. So I think that's something to be on the lookout for. Um, the mass mapper uh, presentation and the Amherst GIS presentation, both programs are fantastic, but I would say if you wanna do some quick work on your own now, go to the mass mapper program because one thing it does have that the Amherst GIS doesn't have is it has current aerial imagery. Oh. So you can go there now and unlike going to say Google Maps or Apple Maps where you look and you look at the solar installations in Amherst and you don't see them or you see one tractor out in the field, um, they have they have uh, aerial imagery that's from, from sorry not 19 from 2021. And that's, I find that to be invaluable when I'm looking at these things. So when you're looking at the Pulpit Hill Solar and when you're looking at Montague Solar, you can actually see them, they're there. Unlike Google Maps, when you go there and you maybe you see a bulldozer you know, going through the field. So having that current uh, aerial photography, I think is critical. So I rec highly recommend it for that. I also highly recommend it for what Martha was looking for, which is the Biomap two layers and also um, there was someone else that was looking for all those endangered species areas. It has all those layers. They're not that hard to find. And I think they'll be invaluable whether you use the mass mapper to do it or whether Mike adds that to the Amherst GIS. Both of those will be eye-opening to you. Um, and one last thing, and I, I know it's kind of beyond your control is public involvement and, and I find these meetings fascinating. I think they've been great. And this group is so well organized, but the meeting time is just so out of reach of, of many, many people that might want to attend. I mean, I can do it. I'm retired. I can sit at home and watch it. Um, but there are you know, lots of other members of the public that don't have this time available. They're out working someplace mm -hmm. and they're missing out a lot. I'm sure they can watch the recording, but you can't respond to a recording. You know, it, it's, it, you lose that interaction with the public. And I think a couple different people today have brought up how important it is for public involvement in this particular process. So I would urge you whenever you can do it, maybe after the summer, you know, switch these meeting times to a time when more of the public can actually be here and be involved because I feel like they're missing out. So, because it's been a really good committee so far. I think that's it for now. Thank you. Great, thank you, Michael. Really helpful. Lenore, Stephanie, go ahead. Okay. Mm -hmm. You can unmute Lenore. Hi, everybody. Can you, you can hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, so first I just, um, my name's Lenore Brick. And I just wanna thank you, first of all, for your collective passion, intelligence, and sincerity and service to the town and to, in this case, really to the world. Um, I, I wanna follow up on, I have three points for now. I wanna follow up on um, not just the importance of community engagement, of course, but I would, I would like to hear a little bit more, this is more of a question, of, of what are some creative ways that the community can be engaged, that you can be informed by lots of different educated and experienced voices um, that, and that the consultant can also be informed. And I missed some of the meetings, so I don't, I'm not sure if you're talking about the technical consultant or the solar consultant or some other consultant, but regardless, um, we have a lot of expertise, not just in our town, but throughout the state and throughout the region about this, the big picture that we're trying to address. Um, and I would be interested in 
um, a forum where there could be a presentation, where there could be other um, consultants, not just people who know about solar, but people who understand how that interacts with the environment. People like conservation biologists, restoration ecologists, forest ecologists, regenerative farmers, climate scientists that understand a little bit more about land use. Um, and th these are emerging fields and silos that have been separated, but are now coming together in the climate movement. And let's not forget that the reason we're doing anything about solar is, is, is because of this big picture that we're trying to heal the climate. Um, and so I, um, I'm asking about that community engagement. I'm also asking that you keep in mind this big picture that, that, that there are guiding principles, even though you're just working on a solar bylaw, it's connected to the much bigger picture of climate collapse and biodiversity collapse. And that we wouldn't be even doing anything with solar if we weren't trying to heal the world that we've so severely damaged. Um, and that that be kind of always ever present, this, this holistic understanding um, and that there are natural laws that we have broken and that we need to take into consideration and, and to not, and this is a, I think the third point, to not be so married to the current laws that, that people make based on their current understanding because the ground is shifting the paradigm is shifting and, and the state is shifting. We're gonna have a new governor. We're going to have new state reps and legislators. Laws will be, enact, will be in process for the next two years and enacted two years later. That might be a year later than, than your charge, but you need to be that kind of forward thinking to be ahead of the game and not rely on just what's been done, what's been thought of, procedures, that have come before you, solar industry standards that have come before you because things are changing quickly as they need to. And so I'm hoping that you can be nimble and that Am Amherst can really do something a little bit different than what's been done before, informed by what's been done before, but with the bravery of doing something you know, big. So I thank you and I offer myself up um, and the, and the network that I have, because I was part of co-founding this regional wide group for um, connecting understanding of climate with ecosystem health, regenerative farming, forests, food systems, all of that. And there's a lot of greater expertise in the region that um, could inform what you're doing. So thank you again. Thank you, Lenore. Yeah, those are good words. <clears throat> Anyone else who's interested in speaking, please raise your hand virtually. Okay, I don't see anyone raising their hands, Dwayne. Okay, great. Uh, seeing none, uh, uh, that's great. Thank you uh, to the public for listening and, and participating. Um, just before we sign off, I, I'm just I, I, uh, give Martha a heads up. I think you're going to be on on tap for taking notes minutes next time. Just looking at my alphabetical list, uh, so that'd be it would be yeah, a okay. wonderful. Good, good to know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, are we going to mention at all uh, agenda items for our next meeting? Or that's helpful. Uh, yes. <laughs> Was that on their agenda? I think so. Yes. <laughs> um, let's let's see. I mean, I guess we're going to have Chris uh, do something more about the the zone the zoning, right? So, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and I know Dwayne. At one point, you had mentioned uh, perhaps giving a review of our of the state uh, the climate plan and uh, or the the, the the rebates and so on. And you know, if you if you wanted to, I'd be willing to do the review of, of the new uh, 2022 climate action plan. If you wanted to review the, uh, what are the rebates and the rules uh, and that kind of thing. I don't know if that's relevant now or not, um, but yeah. <laughs> postpone that for a while. <laughs> yeah, um, would people find that useful? 
mm -hmm. uh, to, to sort of have a, an overview of the um, of the state. Um, I yeah. think two things. One is sort of the state decarbonization roadmap <laughs> as it yeah. pertains as it pertains to uh, solar and land use, particularly. Uh, there's a lot more in there, and then and then a bit of an overview of the um, the current solar program in Massachusetts. Um, okay, um, okay, yeah. we uh, we Martha and I can work on that, yeah, um, and uh, and and have that on our agenda. Um, I wouldn't mind just any additional feedback on the work plan uh -huh. uh, as we put that together, uh, and then in that work plan, I wouldn't mind maybe spending some time on our initial tasks uh, and sort of talking, having a bit of a working meeting to some extent of, of how, um, and this might involve uh, Chris as well, who I, and Chris is still here, yeah, uh, in terms of, um, you know, just this first exercise of sort of um, developing our skeleton or, or outline as I called it, but skeleton's yeah. good too, uh, of, the, um, of the bylaw um, that we can start sort of Hang, hanging, uh, hanging the bones on, I guess, uh, <laughs> um, uh, and and then we can use that to start saying, okay, within the skeleton here, here are some of the major issues that we want to deliberate on. I, I, I know I'm sending like a broken record, but I, I do think, I, I would, and if we're going to do work on the um, uh, work plan, I think we have to be really clear about what we're supposed to deliver to town council and what decisions what tasks we need to do and what decisions we have to make as a group. Um, because I think there's some, without being really clear on that, there's it's gonna be kind of cloudy going, um, you know, and I just think like you have a work plan to deliver X, Y, and Z. And, and I think the charge is pretty clear about what we're supposed to decide and do, but when I'm hearing things, I don't feel like it's that clear in the group. So I would love to, you know, at the top of the work plan, list what we have to provide to town's council, like us, our group, um, what decisions we have to make and what tasks we have to complete. And that doesn't mean that we have to do it in isolation from anybody, but that mm -hmm. we're on the hook for something. I also want to volunteer my time because I have more time than probably most people here. And so I'm happy to work on the skeleton, um, you know, and, and the, you know, so that's, one issue, so I'd love to see that in the agenda. The, I don't know if this is for next time, but I would love to hear two things. Like what have been problems at solar arrays? Cause I, I keep on reading and hearing stuff and then knowing what best practices are in the industry. So the industry itself has probably learned stuff from what they've been doing. And I'd be interested in hearing from people who are in the industry, like what they think are best practices, you know, the improvements they've made and kind of what gets in their way, because we don't want a bylaw that's so complicated and, and ornate that nobody can even understand what we're asking for. Mm -hmm. So that could be it's probably further down the road. But I do think, you know, as an attorney working on litigation, it's like, that's all we saw were the problems, you know. And so I just I think if we know what has happened poorly, that will help us understand what we need to draft or work against. So that could be another meeting. But I just it's it's always in my head, like, People keep on talking about Wendell and I'm not like, I don't have any, I'm not sure about Wendell, you know. Okay, I do like uh, maybe particularly for um, next time agenda item to really hone in on what what are our deliverables um, and and how, how, um, how do we, how do we anticipate them coming together? Uh, yeah. Again, some of that's gonna be uh, strictly on us, uh, but most of it I think is gonna be in concert with either the consultants or the planning planning uh, planning department uh, or other departments, we need them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, okay, great. Uh, Wait, any... Lenore has her hand up again. Oh, okay. And just before we go to Lenore, any other thoughts on agenda topics? Uh, otherwise, um, these are good, uh, good good ideas for sure, and appreciate that. And and uh, Stephanie and I can work on on uh, fleshing that all out. Or, or, and, or if anybody wants to email me directly, you can't do it to everybody. <laughs> and, and Stephanie and, and Chris, uh, other other ideas that you come up with. Okay, uh, Lenore, uh, let's try to make it- uh, Super quick. Super, super quick. I'm yep. unmuted, right? Super yes. quick. Yes. Just, yes. just to Janet's point, I, I had other points and that was one of them that Janet brought up. And I just wanna 
offer, there are people around the state that are watching those projects and monitoring them and have information about that. So there is a way that that can be offered to you in a presentation or in materials or whatever is the best way um, to discuss that so that it doesn't form because I totally agree that learning from the problems in the past can help us um, avoid them in the future. And, and to the point of, of um, you know, Jack and others that are, that are rightly so talking about um, you know, monitoring the construction, what, is, what goes hand in hand with that is anticipating what could be the problems and avoiding them so that it's not just that you have a police there making sure don't do this, don't do that, but how about we set it up so that that's not even gonna, you know, we don't even have to worry about that. And doing this kind of understanding will, will minimize that because you cannot, it, it is never as effective to, to do symptomatic, um, uh, you know, relief and, 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 and firefighting as it is to do prevention. Great. So thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. Okay, uh, I think we're a good in overtime. Uh, and uh, unless there's any last comments, holding, uh, let me officially uh, declare this meeting adjourned. Um, and thank you, everybody. And thank you for going a little bit over time as well. Okay. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Okay, yep, bye-bye.